welcome back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. My name is Grace Gill, and today with me, I have our two co-hosts, Jeff Amrine and Harrison Kitson. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. Glad to be here. Great to be here. Good, good. And our guest today is Tamina Watson. She's the author of The Startup Visa and is working on another project as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tamina. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your origin story um, and, and all of that? Well, thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. I met Jeff recently, but I had known about your podcast and the book and I was just in like, I was fangirling. (laughs) <laughs> so um, I'm an immigration attorney in Seattle, Washington. Um, I actually moved from the United Kingdom, where I was a baby barrister, which didn't really mean much in this country until George Clooney married one. Um, and then I was not a coffee maker anymore. Um, but I practice immigration law and business law specifically at Watson Immigration Law. Uh, I have been working with startups almost since I started practicing without realizing that working with startups is actually a niche. Um, And and in 2008 and 9, you might remember there were layoffs very similar to what's happening now. And that set me on this path of why don't we have a visa for startups? And that led me to do a, to doing a lot of advocacy work. I eventually started working in, um, uh, I got the opportunity to be a volunteer with Hillary Clinton's immigration working group uh, when she was running for office. And then um, I've basically been a consistent voice on needing an immigration uh, solution for startups. Um, In recent history, when the startup scene was, you know, experiencing layoffs, the tech industry has been facing layoffs, it accelerated the need for me to write a new book. And so I'm writing a new book that will come out on July 4th. Outstanding. Tell us a little bit about that. So so for our listeners, frame the situation, why it is so difficult if you're you're immigrating or you want to start a company here and you're from somewhere else, talk about some of the major issues that startup founders would typically face. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, our re-immigration system in the United States was created in 1952. And then the major um, overhaul that we had was in 1990. And then 1990 is where we have all the visa categories that we work with. And at the time, uh, there was a visa created for entrepreneurs, but that's not the modern day entrepreneur. That is what's called an investment visa, where, you know, you invest a bunch of money and you might get a green card. But today's entrepreneur is the person who has amazing ideas, who gets backed by people like Jeff and Startup Junkies and others in the ecosystem, and they go to change the world. WhatsApp is an example. Zoom is an example. There are many examples. But um, the trouble is that the visa category, the immigration system, hasn't kept up with what the modern day needs are. And so the challenges that immigrants face today are that the system doesn't cater towards uh, what they want to do. For example, the H-1B visa, it says you must have a degree and you must have an employer. The H-1B program this year received about 780,000 applications for only 85,000 visas that are available one in 10 chances of being selected. If you don't win the lottery, you can't get an H-1B, even if you are starting your own company. If you are trying to get the O visa, something that a lot of your listeners might know about, the genius visa, um, you need to prove you have sustained credibility. And often people who are coming out of universities um, may not have the level of credibility that's necessary. Now, this administration is making some policy adjustments and um, policy changes to say that if you have a STEM degree and you are working in certain areas, we will uh, consider an O visa for you. So this administration's working towards expanding some of the policies, but the law can only be changed by Congress. And that hasn't happened for a long time. 
and and the statistics are are in favor of there being um, a more rational policy because immigrants in general outperform in terms of the number of new starts, the number of uh, uh, really high growth startups that have been created over the last 25 years. As a percentage of population, immigrants way outperform on a per capita basis. You're absolutely right. But I was actually writing an article to hopefully get published next week. And I was going back through the history of America, and my book has a chapter on it. America is about entrepreneurship. You know, when we had the settlers move here, tobacco was the, the beginning of commercially developed products to enhance the economic development of a region. And then you move forward into, you know, the 1800s, we have Levi's jeans. People don't know or try to remember that Levi's was an immigrant, you know, but now it's a household name. And Levi's in 2022 uh, generated $3 billion worldwide. How many jobs do they create? And then another 100 years later, we have Google. Um, co-founded by an immigrant. And, uh, you know, we're all here in part thanks to the vaccines that we've received so that we could all stay alive. The immigrant co-founded uh, that particular company and the vaccine. And these are some of the stories we know about, hear about. There are so many stories we don't know about. And so immigrants do get the job done, but entrepreneurship is also a through line in the American history. And so if we are looking to have an America that is going to be prosperous for our children, our grandchildren, we need to keep the eye on the ball of making sure the next generation of entrepreneurs come to the US. And this is where we have the next Google and the next thing that's going to change the world. So, you know, as you're talking about kind of this problem, Aside from um, like obviously the Congress and actually changing that law, what are the other obstacles that are existing in the local communities? Is it just a lack of awareness that's kind of causing this problem? That's a really good question. I what I I say to people that if you face a problem, you've got to talk about it. Um, this book that I'm writing uh, actually has an advocacy section because I can't not talk about advocacy. <laughs> um, what I find that, and let's just take one of the examples that your listeners might know about. You have a startup founder who somehow may have gotten a visa to stay here. But the next problem that they face is recruiting. Recruiting is a problem for any business, whether it's a large Fortune 100 company or a startup. There are millions of positions that are open that are not you know, being able to fill uh, right this minute. How do you fill those positions? Um, and it's not just startups. It's the education industry, the medical industry, the hospitality industry, the health industry, the nursing care home who can't find people. Whether you're a business owner in one of those industries or a startup, recruitment is a problem. And so what I say to people is talk about the problem. That is the beginning of advocacy. That is the beginning of awareness to say, well, we have this problem. How do we solve it? And if everybody talks about the problem and they come together, they will be able to say, well, you have that problem. I have that problem. How do we solve it? And the voices become stronger and stronger to say, we need this change. Congress, you represent us. Help us serve our community. One of the things that is so important for me to explain so people understand it is that when businesses cannot fill their positions, who is the loser? It's the American consumer that is the loser. It's the American tax purse that is the loser. You know, we are not helping ourselves by not thinking about the various tools that can solve our economic problems. And immigration is one of those tools. Do you think part of the issue is there's this sort of conflation of the issues that we have with the southern border and the mass migration? that occurs there and all that's going on with the cartels and different things versus the skills-based immigration that we really need as a matter of national security and, and national prosperity. And the, and the other thing that is a trend throughout the EU and throughout 
of Northeastern Asia and the U.S. is the birth rate. The birth rate is extremely low. We we are not having as many kids as we did. We can't grow as many, as much uh, technical talent as we did. And so there's got it. It seems like skills based immigration, a rational policy around that, is the only way to go. What's your outlook for when when is Congress going to get their act together on this? I 100% agree with you, Jeff, and I think there needs to be uh, a push towards dividing these issues because the humanitarian crisis that we see at the border has always um, been put forward as the reason that they can't do anything. Yet where we need to really separate legal immigration as a topic of its own for our own benefit in the future. One of the things that's so important that you mentioned, Jeff, is Europe um, and other countries, the, um, they're all struggling and they're all trying to fight for the next talent. And so just last week, for example, Germany announced that they are going to change their laws to attract skilled workers. Australia did that just a few weeks ago. Canada did that last year, where they said we're going to take 1.45 million immigrants into their countries. And just um, two weeks ago, I think it was not even a week ago, the UK announced um, a high potential visa saying, if you are educated in any of these US schools, we'll just take you. And so what's happening to us? We're taking the international students, we're training them, and then we're saying, ah, we don't want you anymore. And so we're training the next group of talent. And with AI, I mean, you know this better than me being in the industry, AI is at a, in a moment where um, the world is about to change if it hasn't already. And if we don't have the people who can navigate those technology changes to help us in, with our own economy, then where will we be? in the next five to 10 years. In fact, there was a report that came out um, just a week ago. I think the reporter's name was John Marcus, and uh, he was also on NPR yesterday. He talked a lot about these things too, um, basically saying, you know, the student population is already down, international student population. And if we are now sending them away or not letting them stay, we are truly in trouble for the future. And I have been saying that for a while because as an immigration attorney, I see that on a grassroots level, that what is going to happen? You know, I'm a naturalized citizen in this country. I'm so glad you're here, Harrison. We'll see how long you stay and what happens to your future, but I love it. I love being here. America's given me my home, my children are here, and I want a country that my children can prosper in, and, you know, their children can prosper in. And I think we need to use our voices with every tool possible, particularly immigration, to make that happen. Can you speak partly on how you feel as though, more so than just immigrants coming over as individuals, as um, employees at individual companies, but more so on how collectively coming together, how, how important kind of diversity is in this country and, and, and what these new things that you're trying to pass can help with that. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, diversity is here. We are a diverse nation. We were always diverse and we are getting more and more diverse. When it comes to a diverse population, you've got to cater to the needs. And the way you cater to the needs is having professionals who can um, serve them and understand them uh, and feel connected to them. I think the world is a much smaller place than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and probably is it's going to be even smaller with the with all the revolutionary things that AI will do. And I think diversity having a diverse community that is reflected at every level of, you know, whether it's the schools, or the hospitals, or, you know, um, the nursing homes or government, we need that to be reflected. And um, I think we're at a critical moment in our country where COVID has given rise to so many issues that were salient. Um, and I think we have to address all of these issues and immigration, the laws, um, all laws, if you speak to scholars in constitutional law about how you buy a house, you know, 
there were always elements of uh, discrimination in, in everything. Uh, and we can't necessarily take away discrimination in one day, but we can work towards it. You went through the process of, of you were passionate enough about this whole subject that you wrote your first book. And, and a lot of our audience, I know, has great expertise or the subject matter experts, and they may have a book in their heart and in their head that they want to write. Talk about the process that you went through to actually create the book and get it pushed out and, and get it into people's hands. I think that's that's something our audience will probably be pretty interested in as well. Sure. Thank you for asking that question. I think feeling compelled to help people has always been the driving force. But I'll take you a little bit back, uh, further back into how I became a citizen and what happened next. And in fact, with 4th of July, I wrote a, uh, an op-ed for 4th of July at, in the Seattle Times once I became a citizen, and I'll make sure you have it. And I, as I get close to it, I always read that. I became a, um, a green card holder because I fell in love. I had my own sleepless in Seattle moment when I met my husband. And it was a long distance relationship. And eventually we got married and he sponsored me for my green card. And it was, a, it was challenging at the time. And I thought it was like my life was over because I'm stuck in this process. It's nowhere as bad as it is these days. But at that time, it felt challenging. But I couldn't leave the country. I also uh, faced a lot of challenges, uh, you know, at border crossings, um, it, it, all the things that my client face now, clients now face, I was facing them. And so when my clients tell me that this happened or that happened, I relate to them immediately because I was in their shoes at some point. Eventually, we beca I became an immigration lawyer, but I was a citizen after that. And when I became a citizen, I went through the process. I said to my husband, mm, don't come to the ceremony. It's not necessary. It's just a thing I have to do. I was sort of a client at my own office, but he came. And I was so grateful because I cried my heart out um, because, you know, all of us have dreams and our dreams can be different, but they're similar in the sense that we all want happiness, we want a good life, we want to contribute to the world. We do it in different ways. So the details of the dreams are different, but the broad dream is generally the same. And when I was sitting in that um, oath ceremony, I realized, oh my gosh, my dreams are coming true in America. Oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for America. And what happened after that is something shifted in me. I remember that I was working with a client and she said, I need to do this because this is my dream. And something, I don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe there are neurologists out there who can talk about these little trigger moments. Something triggered in me and I'm like, oh my God, I've got to make her dream come true because my dreams have come true. And what was so interesting is I don't tell people to tell me that. But whenever they throw in, that's my dream, something makes me um, even more driven to make their dreams come true. So fast forward to what I mentioned about the layoffs that happened in 2008 and 2009. I had just opened my law firm in 2009, January, and called for about people who were laid off. I live in Seattle, there's uh, Microsoft and Boeing and other big corporations here. And what I kept hearing is, I was laid off, but you know, Tamina, I really want to start my own company. How do I do that? And that was the beginning of this startup journey. But many people said, my dream is to have a startup in America. And that trigger of I need to make somebody's dream come true really sort of drove me into writing this book. So I was writing a lot on my blog about the startup visa. Very few people were writing about it at the time. Some people are doing it now, or more people are, but 2008, nine, not a lot of people were. And so that really got me into this, like, how do I make it happen more? And when immigration reform failed in 2013, where there was a startup visa component, um, one of my clients who's a venture capital um, firm owner in Africa, he said to me, you got to write a book. You have all of this in front of you. And I thought, oh, I have blog pieces. I can write a book. And I started the process with so much confidence that I have so many blog pieces that can turn into a book, only to realize, uh-uh, a book is a lot more than just blog pieces. And you probably know this, Jeff, from all of your experiences. 
Writing a book is not easy. Kudos to every author out there who's ever put their heart on their sleeves to get their message out. But eventually I managed to get my book written with some help and I write about it in my book, but how I got that help. Um, and I feel so grateful that I was able to get the message out. Have we got a startup visa? No. Um, but have we made a dent in the conversation? Yes. And that's leading to my next book that will come out on July 4th. Well, that's a good segue. Talk a little bit about, give us the preview. What's the new book going to be? Well, I realized that having advocated for about 10 years, I'm not going to see a startup visa through Congress. And when that realization came and I accepted that I now need to help people with the law as it stands, the law as it stands that can be used for startup founders, I started to write this book. And then I started to write it in December 2021, having spoken with my editor, who was an amazing person. She's no longer here. But um, life got in the way, so I couldn't make a lot of progress. But then came the layoffs of 2022. And when that happened, when people don't have an employer, just to, for very basic information for anybody who doesn't know, if you want a visa in the United States, you must have an employer who sponsors you. And there are very few avenues in which you can do this on your own as an employer. And so the book is really about explaining how you can have your own company sponsor you for a visa. And so I go through initially in the book about startup strategy, because a lot of people will have the dream of, OK, now I must have a merger and acquisition. I have an exit or I'm going to have an IPO. But I have to be I'm like a, a the Scooby-Doo to a Scrappy-Doo. You know, you remember those cartoons where Scooby-Doo was like, Scrappy-Doo, stop. You know, you can't go anywhere. It's the clients who are thinking about the deals and how we're going to get. The, the sale that we're looking for, they're not necessarily thinking about immigration as an issue, particularly if their visas are reliant on the company or their employees' visas are reliant on the company. So how does the immigration journey simultaneously run with the startup journey? And so that's the initial strategy section in the book. And then I talk about how do you enter the market? How do you start that company with the first visa? It may not be the ultimate goal, but you've got to get your foot in the door. So I go through some of the options. Um, and then once your business is scaling, what do you need to do to get your, yourself secure? Before you can even think about an exit, you need to have your situation secure here for yourself, your investors, your clients, your consumers, your employees. How do you get that permanent um, visa. So the book is covering all of these issues with the current law as it stands with tips and strategies and everything that I've ever learned through my clients' stories and uh, being part of their journeys. So what are you going to call it? And when is, when is it coming out? Yes, this is called the Startup Visa. So now I have a series and it's called the U.S. Immigration Visa Guide for Startups and Founders. It is available, available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, it will be available uh, as a print edition as well as a hard copy. It is already up on a, as an ebook. And when I can catch my breath, there'll be an audio version as well. You're going to do the voiceover for the, the audio I version? I will. I will. You know, um, I, you can see this podcast room behind me. It, it was this podcast room came about because I was recording my previous books. And so I have two books already and both of them are in audio version. So I've got the experience, you know, it's interesting. My 10 year old at the time she was eight, I was practicing reading my book and she goes, mommy, don't read like that. You need some pizzazz in it. <laughs> so <laughs> So through her, you know, critique, I've had some experience in doing some audio books. I'm sure that the uh, the British accent naturally helps somewhat. I, I remember when we moved here originally and our accents were a little bit stronger, that my mum, every single neighbour around the street would be asking her to record their voicemails for them because they thought it was very nice to have a clear British accent on the end of the phone. So I'm sure you get a similar kind of feeling with the audio books. Oh, I love that. I don't know. I don't know if I've, a lot of people have given me uh, feedback on the book, but you know, if you <laughs> listen to it, then please do let me know. 
but I feel very proud. It was an accomplishment. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but now I feel as though I can train people on what to do. <laughs> have, you, have you found the, the advocacy work and being an author? How has that helped your practice as an attorney? Has it driven more clients to you? I know you're doing it out of from your heart and out of the passion of doing it, but it, it, it must have a good impact on business development as well. For sure. I think one of the things that I tell people is that um, there's karma in the world. You know, if you uh, do good, good comes back. I wrote an article not so long ago. So I have a column in a legal magazine called Above the Law. And my New Year's column was Love is a Boomerang. Basically, for one year, I was just testing that the world feels so chaotic. You know, there's the COVID issues that are hampering my clients' lives. How do I solve their immigration problems when these problems haven't come back? Um, you know, as a business, I've suffered issues that all of my clients suffer. Where are the workers? You know, so many things were happening that I said to myself, I'm just going to love. I'm going to love my file more, my clients more, the pen more, the water more. I'm just going to love. And um, I'm not going to worry about anybody else. I'm just going to focus on love. And what I realized is love comes back to you. It comes back to you in spades. And business is like that. If you are putting the good work out there authentically, genuinely loving the people, people will love you back. So I have my practice is successful. I have been in practice since 2009. I have employees and the good work of advocacy comes back as business as well. Um, and so anybody out there who thinks that, you know, losing time on advocacy is a deterrent. No, your expertise in the problem that you and only you can identify will help those who don't have a voice speak up. And those who do have a voice or don't, you know, or getting their voices will need help from you because your voice will attract the, the voices of the others in the similar shoe. And then those collaborations all help towards business. You, you know, your, 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 your points about paying it forward and karma and, and, and just doing these important things and kind of from the heart. It seems timeless and it seems notional and it's been written about and most major religions of the world speak about it. But there's even a lot of scientific, really good peer reviewed stuff from people like Adam Grant, who wrote Give and Take, who said he, he, he characterized three different ways people look at the world. One is takers are those that look to optimize their own position and they're stepping on people their whole career and they, they can optimize in the short term. There's matchers or people that look for reciprocity that say, well, I'll do this, but I expect something in return. And he made the case and then backed it up with lots of anecdotal and empirical evidence around people he called givers. Those that just do it because it's the right thing to do in terms of how they treat people, in terms of, of how they view the world. And it comes back to them many times over, just as you said. And another one that's in the same vein is a guy named Jay Bear wrote a book called Utility. And it was all about um, how to build a brand. But his basic assertion was try to be helpful first before you try to sell anything, regardless of whether you actually ultimately sell anything. If you're helpful first, it will build the kind of uh, brand promise and the feeling about what you're trying to do that's going to capture people's hearts. And they're going to, particularly if you're genuine about it, they're going to come back to you. So your philosophy, I think, is right on. It needs to be done more often. People really need to approach what they're doing in the world with that same kind of point of view. So you're in good, good company with some other thought leaders in addition to yourself. It's really, really good that you're doing it that way. Well, thank you so much. I have to read that book now. But I think, you know, we're on this earth for such a limited amount of time. What's going to be our legacy? You know, how, how are our children going to act? You know, we are mirrors for our children. And if you want to have good people, you've got to mirror that for them. And so I've taken that to heart and I hope my clients see it. But, you know, I've been in business so far, you know, but I do spend a lot of time giving back uh, and I, it drives me. It drives me for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Grace, what's our, our final land the plane type of question? You want to lead it off? Sure. Yes, to, to land the plane, we always ask 
if you go back to the beginning, whatever that is for you, whenever you felt like you were starting out on, on this journey, what would you tell your younger self? I would tell myself that love more. I think the love more has come through experiences. And I think COVID was a moment in time where love more really showed up. But if I were to love more in my early days, I think maybe I could have touched even more lives. Um, maybe my business would be even more successful. I think love is the beginning and end of everything. And it sounds cliche, um, but if you could live it, it will, it will encompass you. Well, I think that that will resonate and, and for all everybody listening. And for everyone listening too, how is the best way to get in contact with you? Uh, thank you, Grace. Um, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. So anybody who wants to connect there, that's great. I am very active on it. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Not that I use Twitter as much. Um, but my book is coming out on July 4th, if you can remember that day. And, you know, the book is going to be useful for not just founders and startups. It's going to be anybody in the ecosystem. You guys are about the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. If people don't know what the problem is within the ecosystem, the ecosystem cannot come together to solve that problem. So whether it's a regional development agency or any, anybody in this ecosystem. So Amazon, you'll find me there, Barnes & Noble as well. But um, And my website is the best place, Watson Immigration law.com. Tamina, thank you so much for coming on. Inspirational. It was great to catch up with you again and, and keep fighting the good fight and doing the great work. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful you had me. Ecosystem builders, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, mayors. If you're interested in taking your economic future into your own hands, we've got a book that can help you. Creating Startup Junkies, Building Sustainable Venture Ecosystems in Unexpected Places is the guide. It's a little bit inspiration. It's a little bit toolkit. What it will allow you to do is take your economic future into your own hands and build a sustainable small business innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in your backyard. If you'd like to hear more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. The Startup Junkie podcast reaches over 100 countries and has had over 100,000 downloads. If you're interested in reaching some of the most motivated and engaged innovators and entrepreneurs on a worldwide basis, give us a shout.